On October 5th, a few days before the king was to declare war, disturbing news reached the generals. A reconnaissance mission revealed that divisions of Napoleon's army, which they had believed was dispersed, had marched east, merged, and was massing deep in southern Prussia. The captain who had led the scouting mission reported that the French soldiers were marching with packs on their backs. Where the Prussians used slow-moving wagons to provision their troops, the French carried their own supplies and moved with astonishing speed and mobility. Before the generals had time to adjust their plans, Napoleon's army suddenly wheeled north, heading straight for Berlin, the heart of Prussia. The generals argued and dithered, moving their troops here and there, trying to decide where to attack. A mood of panic set in. Finally, the king ordered a retreat. The troops would reassemble to the north and attack Napoleon's flank as he advanced toward Berlin. Hohenlohe was in charge of the rear guard, protecting the Prussians' retreat. On October 14th, near the town of Jena, Napoleon caught up with Hohenlohe, who finally faced the battle he had wanted so desperately. The numbers on both sides were equal, but while the French were an unruly force fighting pell-mell and on the run, Hohenlohe kept his troops in tight order, orchestrating them like a corps de ballet. The fighting went back and forth until finally the French captured the village of Wirzenheiligen. Hohenlohe ordered his troops to retake the village. In a ritual dating back to Frederick the Great, a drum major beat out a cadence and the Prussian soldiers, their colors flying, reformed their positions in perfect parade order, preparing to advance. They were in an open plain, though, and Napoleon's men were behind garden walls and on the house roofs. The Prussians fell like ninepins to the French marksmen. Confused, Hohenlohe ordered his soldiers to halt and change formation. The drums beat again. The Prussians marched with magnificent precision, always a sight to behold. But the French kept shooting, decimating the Prussian line. Never! Had Hohenlohe seen such an army, the French soldiers were like demons. Unlike his disciplined soldiers, they moved on their own, yet there was method to their madness. Suddenly, as if from nowhere, they rushed forward on both sides, threatening to surround the Prussians. The prince ordered a retreat. The Battle of Jena was over. Like a house of cards, the Prussians quickly crumbled, one fortress falling after another. The king fled east. In a matter of days, virtually nothing remained of the once mighty Prussian army. Interpretation The reality facing the Prussians in 1806 was simple. They had fallen fifty years behind the times. Their generals were old, and instead of responding to present circumstances, they were repeating formulas that had worked in the past. You might find the Prussian army just an interesting historical example, but in fact, you are likely marching in the same direction yourself. What limits individuals as well as nations is the inability to confront reality, to see things for what they are. As we grow older, we become more rooted in the past. Habit takes over. Something that has worked for us before becomes a doctrine, a shell to protect us from reality. Repetition replaces creativity. We rarely realize we're doing this because it is almost impossible for us to see it happening in our own minds. Then, suddenly, a young Napoleon crosses our path, a person who does not respect tradition, who fights in a new way. Only then do we see that our ways of thinking and responding have fallen behind the times. Never take it for granted that your past successes will continue into the future. Actually, your past successes are your biggest obstacle. Every battle, every war is different, and you cannot assume that what worked before will work today. You must cut yourself loose from the past and open your eyes to the present. Your tendency to fight the last war may lead to your final war. Keys to Warfare in looking back on an unpleasant or disagreeable experience, the thought inevitably occurs to us, 
If only we had said or done X instead of Y. If only we could do it over. Even Prince Hohenloha, years later, could see how he had botched the retaking of Wirzenheiligen. The problem, though, is not that we think of the solution only when it is too late. The problem is that we imagine that knowledge is what was lacking. If only we had known more. If only we had thought it through more thoroughly. That is precisely the wrong approach. What makes us go astray in the first place is that we are unattuned to the present moment, insensitive to the circumstances. We are listening to our own thoughts, reacting to things that happened in the past, applying theories and ideas that were digested long ago, but that have nothing to do with our predicament in the present. More books, theories, and thinking only make the problem worse. Understand. The greatest generals, the most creative strategists, stand out not because they have more knowledge, but because they are able, when necessary, to drop their preconceived notions and focus intensely on the present moment. That is how creativity is sparked and opportunities are seized. Knowledge, experience, and theory have limitations. No amount of thinking in advance can prepare you for the chaos of life for the infinite possibilities of the moment. The great philosopher of war, Karl von Clausewitz, called this friction, the difference between our plans and what actually happens. Since friction is inevitable, our minds have to be capable of keeping up with the change and adapting to the unexpected. The better we can adapt our thoughts to changing circumstances, the more realistic our responses to them will be. The more we lose ourselves in pre-digested theories and past experiences, the more inappropriate and delusional our response. It can be valuable to analyze what went wrong in the past, but it is far more important to develop the capacity to think in the moment. In that way, you will make far fewer mistakes to analyze. Think of the mind as a river. The faster it flows, the better it keeps up with the present and responds to change. The faster it flows, also, the more it refreshes itself and the greater its energy. Obsessional thoughts, past experiences, whether traumas or successes, and preconceived notions are like boulders or mud in this river, settling and hardening there and damming it up. The river stops moving, stagnation sets in. You must wage constant war on this tendency in the mind. The first step is simply to be aware of the process and of the need to fight it. The second is to adopt the few tactics that might help you to restore the mind's natural flow. Re-examine all of your cherished beliefs and principles. When Napoleon was asked what principles of war he followed, he replied that he followed none his genius was his ability to respond to circumstances, to make the most of what he was given. He was the supreme opportunist. Your only principle, similarly, should be to have no principles, to believe that strategy has inexorable laws or timeless rules is to take up a rigid, static position. That will be your undoing. Be brutal with the past, with tradition, with the old ways of doing things. Declare war on sacred cows and voices of convention in your own head. Erase the memory of the last war. The last war you fought is a danger, even if you won it. If you were victorious, you will tend to repeat the strategies you just used, for success makes us lazy and complacent. If you lost... You may be skittish and indecisive. Do not think about the last war. Instead, do whatever you can to blot it from your mind. Ted Williams, perhaps baseball's greatest pure hitter, made a point of always trying to forget his last at-bat. Whether he'd gotten a home run or a strikeout, he put it behind him. No two at-bats are the same, even against the same pitcher, and Williams wanted an open mind. He would not wait for the next at-bat to start forgetting. The minute he got back to the dugout, he started focusing on what was happening in the game taking place. Attention to the details of the present is by far the best way to crowd out the past 
and forget the last war. Keep the mind moving. When we were children, our minds never stopped. We were open to new experiences and absorbed as much of them as possible. We learned fast because the world around us excited us. When we felt frustrated or upset, we would find some creative way to get what we wanted and then quickly forget the problem as something new crossed our path. All the greatest strategists, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Musashi, were childlike in this respect. Sometimes, in fact, they even acted like children. The reason is simple. Superior strategists see things as they are. They are highly sensitive to dangers and opportunities. Nothing stays the same in life, and keeping up with circumstances as they change requires a great deal of mental fluidity. Great strategists do not act according to preconceived ideas. They respond to the moment, like children. Their minds are always moving, and they are always excited and curious. They quickly forget the past. The present is much too interesting. Absorb the spirit of the times. Throughout the history of warfare, there have been classic battles in which the past has confronted the future in a hopeless mismatch. In each case, the conquering army developed a way of fighting that maximized a new form of technology or a new social order. You can reproduce this effect on a smaller scale by attuning yourself to the spirit of the times. Developing antennae for the trends that have yet to crest takes work and study, as well as the flexibility to adapt to those trends. As you get older, it is best to periodically alter your style. By constantly adapting and changing your style, you will avoid the pitfalls of your previous wars. Just when people feel they know you, you will change. Reverse Course Relationships often develop a certain tiresome predictability. You do what you usually do, other people respond the way they usually do, and around it goes. If you reverse course, act in a novel manner, you alter the entire dynamic. Do this every so often to break up the relationship's stale patterns and open it to new possibilities. Think of your mind as an army. Armies must adapt to the complexity and chaos of modern war by becoming more fluid and maneuverable. The ultimate extension of this evolution is guerrilla warfare, which exploits chaos by making disorder and unpredictability a strategy. The guerrilla army never stops to defend a particular place or town. It wins by always moving, staying one step ahead. By following no set pattern, it gives the enemy no target. The guerrilla army never repeats the same tactic. It responds to the situation, the moment, the terrain where it happens to find itself. There is no front, no concrete line of communication or supply, no slow-moving wagon. The guerrilla army is pure mobility. That is the model for your new way of thinking. Apply no tactic rigidly. Do not let your mind settle into static positions, defending any particular place or idea, repeating the same lifeless maneuvers. Attack problems from new angles, adapting to the landscape and to what you're given. By staying in constant motion, you show your enemies no target to aim at. You exploit the chaos of the world instead of succumbing to it. Reversal there is never any value in fighting the last war. But while you're eliminating that pernicious tendency, you must imagine that your enemy is trying to do the same, trying to learn from and adapt to the present. Err on the side of caution. Be ready. Never let your enemy surprise you in war. Three. Amidst the turmoil of events, do not lose your presence of mind. The counterbalance strategy. In the heat of battle, the mind tends to lose its balance. Too many things confront you at the same time. Unexpected setbacks, doubts, and criticisms from your own allies. There's a danger of responding emotionally with fear, depression, or frustration. 
It is vital to keep your presence of mind, maintaining your mental powers, whatever the circumstances. You must actively resist the emotional pull of the moment, staying decisive, confident, and aggressive no matter what hits you. Make the mind tougher by exposing it to adversity. Learn to detach yourself from the chaos of the battlefield. Let others lose their heads. Your presence of mind will steer you clear of their influence and keep you on course. The Hyper-Aggressive Tactic Vice Admiral Lord Horatio Nelson, 1758-1805, had been through it all. He had lost his right eye in the Siege of Calvi and his right arm in the Battle of Tenerife. He had defeated the Spanish at Cape St. Vincent in 1797 and had thwarted Napoleon's Egyptian campaign by defeating his navy at the Battle of the Nile the following year. But none of his tribulations and triumphs prepared him for the problems he faced from his own colleagues in the British Navy as they prepared to go to war against Denmark in February 1801. Nelson, England's most glorious war hero, was the obvious choice to lead the fleet. Instead, the Admiralty chose Sir Hyde Parker, with Nelson his second in command. This war was a delicate business. It was intended to force the disobedient Danes to comply with a British-led embargo on the shipping of military goods to France. The fiery Nelson was prone to lose his cool. He hated Napoleon, and if he went too far against the Danes, he would produce a diplomatic fiasco. Sir Hyde was an older, more stable, even-tempered man who would do the job and nothing more. Nelson swallowed his pride and took the assignment, but he saw trouble ahead. He knew that time was of the essence. The faster the Navy sailed, the less chance the Danes would have to build up their defenses. The ships were ready to sail, but Parker's motto was, Everything in good order. It wasn't his style to hurry. Nelson burned for action. He reviewed intelligence reports, studied maps, and came up with a detailed plan for fighting the Danes. He wrote to Parker urging him to seize the initiative. Parker ignored him. At last, on March 11th, the British fleet set sail. Instead of heading for Copenhagen, however, Parker anchored well to the north of the city's harbor and called a meeting of his captains. According to intelligence reports, he explained, the Danes had prepared elaborate defenses for Copenhagen. Boats anchored in the harbor, forts to the north and south, and mobile artillery batteries could blast the British out of the water. How to fight this artillery without terrible losses? Also, pilots who knew the waters around Copenhagen reported that they were treacherous, places of sandbars and tricky winds. Navigating these dangers under bombardment would be harrowing. With all of these difficulties, perhaps it was best to wait for the Danes to leave harbor and then fight them in open sea. Nelson struggled to control himself. Finally, he let loose, pacing the room, the stub of his lost arm jerking as he spoke. No war, he said, had ever been won by waiting. The Danish defenses looked formidable to those who are children at war, but he had worked out a strategy weeks earlier. He would attack from the south the easier approach, while Parker and a reserve force would stay to the city's north. Nelson would use his mobility to take out the Danish guns. He had studied the maps. Sandbars were no threat. As for the wind, aggressive action was more important than fretting over wind. Nelson's speech energized Parker's captains. He was by far their most successful leader, and his confidence was catching. Even Sir Hyde was impressed, and the plan was approved.